So our next speaker is Matt Swoboda from Fairlight. So take Thank it away, you. Matt. Thanks. Does this work? Yeah. Hello, I'm Matt Swoboda from Sony Computer Entertainment, also known as Smash of Fairlight. Welcome. I'm really, really hungover, I'm afraid, so I don't really know how this is going to go, but let's just see how we get on. All right. So, um, DirectX 11's kind of new last couple of years it was released. Um, we, everyone used DirectX 9 for a very long time. It was around since about 2001. So everyone's very comfortable with it. The uh, problem is that it doesn't really suit modern graphics hardware. So uh, it's, there's a very good reason to upgrade to DirectX 11. You get a lot of new features out of it, uh, the critical things being compute shaders, uh, much improved shading language. Uh, tessellation, and a load of other nice little features that uh, may make you able to use the full use of the hardware. What I'm going to talk about today really is um, using DX11 for demo effects really I guess, or sort of more, uh, more visual effects than sort of the classic game rendering kind of things. So we're going to talk more about effects today. The first thing I'm going to talk about is um, procedural mesh generation or geometry generation. That's actually not entirely true what I'm talking about that, but let's see. Uh, has anyone used sine distance fields before? Put your hands up if you have. Hands up. I know you have. Get your hands up. All right, that's not that many. Has anyone used DirectX 11 before? Has anyone used DirectX 9 before? Is anyone not a coder? Apart from here. Yeah. That's very honest of you. This is going to be tough on you, I will not lie. Uh, so, sign distance fields. Uh, the concept of sign distance fields is very simple. It's a field or a, a function uh, that defines the distance at any point in space to the surface of your object. A sign distance field is negative inside the object or positive outside the object. So, you get a lot of information from it about the object and about the curvature of the object and so on. This is a very powerful tool. The reason it's powerful is, when it comes to geometry generation, the greatest thing in the world is to be able to type in a random formula and get a result out of it, and not have to care about things like the way your triangles are ordered and such like. Uh, assigned distance fields give you this. You can essentially put in a random formula that takes a point in space and gives you a number, and you'll get something out of it. So it's great. Uh, they're very powerful. Uh, you can generate, you can u mix up meshes, formulae, particles, fluids, voxels, all kinds of primitives. Uh, it's very easy to do things like CSG, Boolean effects, um, distortions on the field. And the main point being that you don't have to care about the topology. You can just uh, generate the field and worry about the actual mesh you get out of it later. Here's an example. Um, so the formula for a box is very, very simple. It's just uh, the point is it's basically just uh, a couple of lines to give you a box. From that box, you can cut it by taking other boxes and just subtracting their distance from the uh, box distance. So you can start generating quite complex shapes very quickly. Uh, you can do more cutting quite easily. You can cut in cylinders, other, other uh, primitives quite easily. You can repeat shapes very easily. It's very easy to repeat space and uh, upscale things very simply. You can cut more holes in the repeated shape. Start combining multiple things. Um, CSG, brilliant them together. Repeat the space again. You see the code change is just like that one line. It's quite simple to do. Uh, keep repeating the space. Add some details. Yes, I did those little. Uh, planks on the floor, massive thing. Uh, add uh, lighting, very easy to ray cast through distance fields. So uh, it's possible to do things like shadows and volumetrics very cheaply. Uh, add some textures. The way we did textures in this case was just to uh, uh, take and have another shader which just generates um, a color based on a point in space, very simple. And finally, you get a result. Well done. 
So as you can see, we started off from something very simple, lots of small elements, add them all together, and you come up with something good enough to play second in the PC demo competition at assembly, but not first. Uh, so anyway, once you have this field, uh, what do you want to do with it? You want to render it, right? So the critical point, because that wasn't really very DX11, the critical point of this talk is how to take a distance field and turn it into a mesh with marching cubes. Who has implemented marching cubes before? Who, is, who knows what marching cubes is? Cool. That's much easier than I hoped. Uh, so the way that, why do we want to generate a triangle mesh? You can ray trace sine distance fields relatively easily and cheaply. The reason that you want to generate a mesh is that, well, there's a number of reasons. It suits the 3D hardware better to render meshes. Hard 3D hardware is designed to render triangles fast. By giving it triangles, you help it along a bit. You can reuse the mesh for multiple passes, so you can reuse it for shadows, um, deferred rendering passes quite easily. Uh, it's easy to mess with the mesh afterwards. Um, you can displace it and so on. Uh, it, the speed and the complexity of rendering the mesh or generating the mesh is not dependent on screen resolution. So when we go full HD res, it doesn't dramatically uh, reduce the performance. The really good reason why you want to generate a mesh, which I didn't put on the slide, is because it means that you can use really bad quality distance fields that don't really tell the truth about distances to shapes and get away with it. When you ray trace, it screws up. When you use meshing, it doesn't. So we're going to use marching cubes for this. Uh, I don't really want to explain marching cubes. It's quite long. Uh, basically, you have a grid, and at points in space, you evaluate how far, well, the, how far you are from the surface. And when the, chi when the sign changes across grid cells, then uh, that's where you put uh, edges. And then you combine all the edges to uh, triangles. It's on Wikipedia. It's a really good explanation on Wikipedia. Mine was rubbish, I'm sorry. But read Wikipedia, it's good. Not about everything. Actually, in Wikipedia, apparently, all it talks about Fairlight is how we were busted by the FBI. How rude. That wasn't even us. That was a whole other division. Anyway, I digress. I'm sorry. Um, marching cubes issues. To get a good quality mesh out of marching cubes, you need a lot of grid cells. You have to evaluate a lot of grid cells. Um, two million cells gives you a reasonable density of mesh. Uh, that's quite a lot to evaluate. So you only want to process that whole grid uh, as little as you can. The major problem is that tr the triangle count that you get out of a marching cubes mesh uh, is not bounded, by, well, it's bounded, but the bound is very high. The triangle count changes all the time based on the field. So you don't know how many triangles you're going to get until you generate them, which means it's quite hard to allocate memory for, quite hard to manage. Uh, and the other thing is that actually most of the cells are empty. So if you're doing something heavy per cell, you're wasting your time most of the time. It's not really worth it. Traditionally, marching cubes for these reasons, um, particularly the memory bounding, the uh, triangle count issue, GPUs are not traditionally good at things that vary a lot per frame. They're very good at fixed problems that they can cope with in one block. They're not very good with these varying problems. So it traditionally gets implemented on CPU. The, we can implement marching cubes in DX10 or 11 using geometry shaders. Has anyone ever written a geometry shader? How did it feel? Was it good? Yeah, it's cool. Um, geometry shaders are not particularly efficient on any GPU to date. Uh, so, what happens? Uh, you can evaluate, so you can evaluate marching cubes in a geometry shader by running the shader on every cell. Uh, and calculating the triangles you get per cell and outputting them. The reason this doesn't really work is that uh, geometry shaders are very inefficient. They push things back to memory when uh, counts change per instance. So they're really inefficient. And this varying result, because a lot of the cells are empty and produce no triangles, it means that the, uh, the work done per instance of the shader varies so much that um, it doesn't work very well on the architecture. We're going to do it the better way. The better way 
is to use a technique called stream compaction. Has anyone ever heard of stream compaction? OK, cool. Um, stream compaction, in a nutshell, is to take something sparsely populated, a large array, and uh, push all the filled elements together. So you have a small array of only the filled elements. That's the idea behind it. So you take a big, sparse array, squash all the elements together, and get a small array, a small block of memory that you can process in one batch. This is a very useful technique for many, many things, and it's particularly important on DirectX 11, because you have a lot of these problems where you have a sparse data set that you only want to process small parts of. Uh, so you want to compact them. If it means that the problem you get with the geometry shader solution where you have uh, lots of varying length instances, like uh, each uh, instance of the shader has to do different amounts of work. Uh, it goes away because you essentially found all the things that need work, pushed them together, and only executed the shader for that. So it's a very important technique. Um, the way that we implement this uh, is a technique called histopyramids. Um, histopyramids is kind of related to MIP mapping on 3D textures. Essentially, you start with a sparse grid, pardon me, uh, work out the count of the instances in every cell. Then you walk down the MIP chain for that, and at each one, you take the count of the eight cells above in the previous level of the MIP chain, how much do you get a total? So the bottom cell, the one by one by one cell, contains the total count for the whole grid. And then you walk back up the array, and you count up the offsets from a previous pattern. And that gives you the location in the output array at every point in the grid. So here's my diagram describing this. I'm a master of these diagram packages, as you can tell. Um, so you can see how, as you walk down the chain, you're counting and averaging the uh, ones above it, color-coded for your benefit. And then walking up, you uh, count the offsets uh, to regenerate the, uh, so the final um, array contains the offset of the, in the output array of every element. Uh, so what do we use these things for? Um, for marching cubes, we take the grid, count the number of triangles per cell, uh, generate a histopyramid, so we have the output, uh, so we know where in the compacted array all the triangles are going to go. Then we use a nice thing you can do on DirectX 11 uh, using indirect draw calls. Indirect draw calls are something that probably people have wanted for many, many years. It enables the GPU to kick a draw call, but where the GPU defines how many primitives are rendered. What that means is you can do a load of work on GPU to work out how much to do, and then the GPU can also tell the next passes using that count how much to render. Previously, the only way you could define the length of a draw call was the CPU had to do it, which means that you would find out the count on GPU, transfer it back to the CPU, add lots and lots of latency while you wait for everything to catch up, and then uh, the CPU kicks the draw call. It means that you either introduced a very large stall or two frames of latency, which is not ideal. This gets around this problem, it removes the latency. It's great. Uh, so here's, an here's a, the results of our uh, marching cues on GPU. I had a blobby, a man made of blobs, and then uh, I turned him into fluids. I'll show a video of it later. But essentially, this is all marching cubes generated on a 1 to 8 cubed grid cell in real time, taking, well, it's live, I'll figure right now, about 10 milliseconds or something that I pulled out of my head. Uh, so that is the nature of marching cubes. I'm going to go back, actually. So the, the concept of marching cubes uh, like that means that we can only execute the geometry shader on the, instances that the, um, on the cells of the grid that actually have something going on. It means that we take something that took around 150 milliseconds to execute for a whole grid on a sparse operation down to something like 5 milliseconds. It's quite worth doing. Fluid dynamics. I love fluid dynamics. I have kind of an addiction to them. Um, on DX9, 
we did implement a fluid dynamics solution, but it was kind of fake. Finally, on DX11, we were able to do it properly. Has anyone ever played with fluid dynamics before? Cool. Uh, DX, uh, so, fluid dynamics, uh, the way it's smoothed particle hydrodynamics in this case. The way this works essentially is for every particle, you work out other particles around it nearby, and then you calculate the forces that interoperate between them. This causes one major computation problem, which is finding all the particles near another particle. It's a very difficult problem. Uh, so we call this a neighborhood search. Essentially, this is a very difficult problem because the number of neighbors for every particle is completely varied based on the current state of the system. It's not bounded, and uh, it's quite hard to process in an efficient way. You can't take a million particles and then search through a million particles for every particle to work out what, which ones are near, because obviously that would be ridiculous. So you have to find efficient ways of implementing it. Uh, we use compute shaders to solve this in a nice way. Essentially, what we do is um, we bucket sort all the particles into grid cells. And the way we implement the bucket sort is with histopyramid stream compaction again. This technique keeps coming up and coming up because it gets used for so many effect-based tasks. That's why I'm mentioning it quite a lot. And it's why it's really worth reading the uh, papers and implementing. So the way this works is we work out the count of the number of particles in every bucket. Then we stream compact that count buffer. So we have a spa, like a, an array where we know that we have enough space allocated for every grid cell. Then we do another pass, and we put the particles into the pre-allocated memory blocks. So that gives us a compacted, bucket-sorted uh, particle array. The reason that compaction is important is because if we just try to allocate like a worst-case block of memory, saying that um, we'll say every cell can have 32 particles in it or something, for one thing, that might not be enough in some cells, and for another thing, it costs incredibly large amounts of memory that we just don't have. This gives us a way of actually only having buckets or a bucket buffer big enough, as big as the number of particles we have. So it's all compacted, so it's much more efficient. So we bucket all the particles into cells. And then we evaluate, we take each particle and we look at the bucket it's in and we look at all the particles in that bucket because they're the neighbors. You also have to uh, process neighboring cells as well. This gives us, um, we, we calculate the forces from every particle on our particle. And uh, using a simple equation, sum up all the results and output the new acceleration. It's very simple. Um, the performance of this basically massively depends on the number of particles you evaluate for each one. Uh, so the size of the neighborhood for every particle. Which, de which is dependent on the area, the smoothing area of each particle, the number of particles in the system, and other things like that. Uh, we did quite a lot of work trying to speed this up because it was really, really slow. It was taking sort of 10 frames to evaluate for a decent particle count. So we did quite a lot of work on um, improving this. Uh, we tried a lot of things like changing the size of the bucket cells. Um, changing the smoothing radius of the particles, and, uh, and then we cheated big time. Um, so what we did was uh, when we used very small cells, much smaller than the size of the actual um, particle's radius, we'll evaluate the cell that the particle's actually in. Uh, we, have, we check all the particles properly, and for all the rest, we just fake it and use an average position of the particles in that cell and just compare that. So uh, it's a massive cheat, but it actually works quite well and the performance is good. Uh, this gives us a result good enough to be like uh, accurate fluid dynamics, the kind of thing that you get from a proper fluid dynamics solver like real flow that runs offline and takes many hours to simulate. We can actually do that in real time now, which is cool. In some form of cool, I guess. Come on, man. There you go. So that is a video of our... Um, is that not appearing on your screen at all, is it? No. 
That sucks. Hang on. There's a really nice video running on my screen and not yours. If anyone wants to see the nice video that I have running on my screen, come up to my computer afterwards. It's well worth it. Sorry about that. Hang on, let's see if I can... Uh, no, not happening. Oh, well. I'll show you. I'll try and get the video working later. What's that? Uh, maybe I can remove the entire window. You're right. He's right. Hang on. Yeah. Come on, man. Where's it gone? Where's it gone? I'm giving up. I'm sorry. It's too hard. Presentations are tough. So actually, oh, I've seen what kind of stuff she made. Are we back? We're back. Sorry about that. I'll try and show the video afterwards. Computers suck. Let's be honest about that. Uh, so, moving on from fluids and meshes, I'm going to talk now about ray tracing on GPU. Has anyone ever implemented a ray tracer on GPU? Hey, one person. Um, ray tracing is... Uh, Oh, great. Ray tracing is quite a complicated problem. Um, let me talk to you about the rendering pipeline that we will have in the next few years. Primary rays, the things that come from the camera or a light, will still be rasterized. The reason they'll still be rasterized is that 3D hardware, as I may have mentioned, is very, very good at rendering triangles. It's not very good at ray tracing triangles, really. Uh, however, there are some effects you just can't do very easily with triangles or rasterization, such as um, global illumination, such as reflections, uh, these kind of things, uh, such as subsurface scattering. Things that you can't do because you need knowledge of the whole scene, they're not tracing convergent rays, they're tracing massively divergent or random rays, uh, which you can't implement very easily with rasterization. This is why uh, we'll start increasingly using ray tracing to push the next level of quality um, over the next few years. Um, so how do you implement a ray tracer on DX11 that ray traces triangles? Essentially, what you do is you put all the triangles into an acceleration structure. And the acceleration structure of choice on GPU is a bounding volume hierarchy. It's um, basically a hierarchy of bounding boxes in a tree. Uh, and at the bottom of the tree, on the leaf nodes, you get um, triangles. So you can implement this in a way that uh, is very suitable for shader traversal. You can do it uh, in a way that's stackless. So as uh, you walk down the tree, you don't have to store a history of where you went. You can just use a simple structure that enables you to traverse without any stack. It makes it implementable in a shader. GPUs are quite good at these kind of problems uh, because they can throw, because it's a very parallelizable problem. You can throw lots and lots of cores at it. It's good for GPU. Um, the reason that it's not good for GPU is that it's quite heavy on branches, which we'll get to in a minute. Here's some shots of uh, me playing with a ray tracer. And essentially, what I was doing here was path tracing through a box or a triangle mesh or something. Yeah, hello. Man. Oh, sorry. There we go. Do you, do you see that slide as well? You didn't see that slide either, do you? Oh, God. Read the slide now. All right, there, that's what I was trying to show. So we did a path trace to running on GPU. And uh, it's, uh, it gave us uh, the ability to do these kind of subsurface scattering effects, bounce effects, this kind of thing. Let me talk to you about the way a shader works on a modern GPU. Uh, essentially, a shader um, runs small programs, very small programs, lots and lots of times over a very wide parallel piece of hardware. Uh, the way this is done is uh, there's a scheduler which takes all the work coming in, splits it into little batches and sends them off to cores. 
cores work typically on blocks of sort of 64 things, 32 things at once. So uh, pixels come in, they get pushed into one batch, then the thing executes the batch on a core. There's normally lots and lots of batches in flight, like a thousand batches in flight or so on. This is why it's so important that GPUs are fed stuff early. Uh, for compute shaders, you get to choose the size of your own batches. You get to choose what gets scheduled how. Uh, the complex thing about this is the shaders are actually quite dumb. The hardware is quite dumb. It, the way it implements things like branches. Uh, essentially, a shader is more like a very, very wide SIMD unit than it is a, uh, like a normal CPU. It's, like, it's executing essentially like a 64 wide SIMD unit. 32 wide, depends on your hardware. Uh, so this is fine for normal operations because if you're running the same program on every uh, SIMD lane, all it does is just tick through the, the ath arithmetic operations one by one on the lane. It's very simple. A complicated case comes when you introduce branches and loops. Uh, shader branching is traditionally quite a, uh, a difficult issue for GPUs. The way that it's implemented now on a modern GPU is that all the lanes always execute the same code all the time, even if they branch. If uh, one lane branches, or well, if all the lanes branch, then they all just keep stepping the same piece of code. If some lanes branch and some lanes don't branch, what happens is that the lanes that don't branch just go dead. They just wait in an idle state for the other lanes which do branch to finish. So it means you get the situation where uh, if half the lanes branch, then um, half the lanes are going to be idle and half the lanes are going to be executing the branch piece of code until they get to the end of that branch code and they all resume, they all converge again. When you have an if-else kind of case, what you get is if some lanes hit one case and some hit the other, then all the lanes that hit the if execute while the others are all dead, and then all the lanes that hit the else execute afterwards while the others are dead. So essentially, if some lanes in your batch go in the if case and some go in the else case, you pay the cost of both cases. So when you have heavy branching, like in a ray tracer, like we're traversing a tree, and you're doing uh, branches that go if, there, if else all the time, uh, unless your rays are all taking the same path in that batch, then you're going to be paying the cost of both cases all the time. You're going to be going twice as slow as if, uh, essentially, you're going to be paying both cases. And if you've got loops as well, what happens with a loop is that if, one lane ha if some lane's loop counts differ, then they pay the cost of the longest count. The whole, la the whole batch pays the longest count. So this really makes you think about how you architect stuff. Uh, when it comes to ray tracing, Coherence is the real uh, issue at stake. If all your rays take the same path through your bounding volume hierarchy, then they're all going to hit in one, in one uh, batch. They're all going to go through the same path through the shader, which means that they're going to hammer through the shader very efficiently. If all your rays are taking different divergent paths in a batch, then they're going to be doing the worst case scenario all the time. And essentially, with the bounding volume hierarchy, if you're using random rays, like what you get in ambient occlusion, global illumination, uh, you can get it with reflections and stuff as well. It means that you end up paying almost like you don't have any acceleration structure at all. It's that bad. You're hammering, uh, you're doing the worst thing for the shader. That's why uh, it's so important to try and use convergent rays. And it's also why um, things like global illumination, even though you can race them, ray trace them, end up being really heavy and painful on GPUs. Uh, we wanted to implement ambient occlusion with a ray tracer, and uh, it wasn't really that um, efficient using the uh, ray tracing method, so we had to come up with something else. Um, the way that we ended up doing it is using the sine distance field structures that we already had and uh, generating them for our objects and just ray tracing through those. Uh, this gives you a much better result, a uh, much quicker result, because essentially tracing a sine distance field is branchless. It doesn't require um, 
it doesn't cause this sort of thrashing of the shader batches in the, um, the way that ray tracing does. Uh, so we don't really ray cast either. We just send out a load of samples into space and see the distances and kind of cheat a bit. So here's some results. Uh, taking a random object made by Louis of CNCD and uh, trying to generate ambient occlusion on it. That's what you get if you trace four random rays per pixel. So you get if you cast 16 rays per pixel, it starts looking quite good. Four, bit shit. 16, quite good. 64 starts looking really nice. 256 starts looking clean. I mean, this is with no post blowing or anything, just purely the average of lots and lots of rays. This gives you a kind of result that actually looks passable for if you baked it in Maya or something. Um, but it's way too slow. It takes an enormous amount of time. Um, reckon that the 256 ray case was taking like 200 milliseconds or something. It wasn't practical. Uh, we got a quality and performance balance to maintain here. We get good quality with around 16 to 64 rays. We get good performance, like a, a real-time game suitable or demo suitable performance with um, you're taking just a few milliseconds to execute. We get that with one to four rays per pixel, which is way too noisy. Um, this is where we start using uh, temporal reprojection. Temporal reprojection is a really simple concept. Uh, you use the previous frame, basically, and blend it in. But you do it in a smart way. Uh, so you back project using the camera from the previous frame to work out where your current, where each pixel was in the image. So you get this coherent thing, and you read from that. Uh, it's a very simple, very useful technique. Uh, so we're using temporary projection. We use a very small number of rays per pixel, one to four. And by reprojecting, we get the results as if there was a lot more. Uh, so we obviously have to keep the previous frames data around. We have to keep positions and so on from previous frames. But generally, it works great. There's one major problem with temporal reprojection, which is where you try and back project a pixel and you can't find it in the previous frame. So you get holes. And that's the problem we need to try and solve. Uh, so this is when temporal reprojection looks good. It looks basically like a very high quality, uh, like the 256 ray case, but much faster, um, much simpler, uh, much uh, quicker to implement. And here's where it looks bad. Same case, we've moved slightly, and you can see there are a lot of holes in the image. And when, so all we've been able to do in the holes is just cast, use the result from one ray. It looks terrible. Uh, so we need to find a way of solving the, ro uh, the holes. The good thing, oh, oh this, well, this one actually works. Hmm? Hang on. Come on, man. All right. So this is a uh, temporary projection working, one ray per pixel reprojected. And that's what happens when you move the camera. You see the holes. I have no idea why that video works and the other one doesn't. So as you see, uh, the holes are a major problem. If we could only fix the holes, then we'd be good. Uh, we have a really good way of filling holes with ambient occlusion. We can just cast shitloads and shitloads of rays for the hole pixels. That's a simple way of solving it, uh, which is great. So we have a way of making this result perfect. The problem is that doing that thing of casting loads of rays uh, is that's when it starts dragging performance down. And um, then we get into the issue of coherence again, the exact same issue I was talking about with ray tracing. If I've got a little batch of pixels, say an 8 by 8 block of pixels, and some of my pixels are reprojected perfectly, and uh, I can just use the previous frame, and some of them are not reprojected perfectly, and we need to cast loads of rays, we get this situation where for every batch where some of that occurs, we're paying for the entire batch to do the really slow thing. So it starts hurting us a lot. It means that we're considering in that image, we had holes on probably, if you had a, an average buffer of like um, eight by eight pixels, there's probably holes in about 50% of the blocks. Uh, it means that we're paying, essentially we could have just done loads of rays for 50% of the pixels. Uh, which is not what we wanted to do, particularly when there's probably only about 5% of the pixels that are doing it. Uh, so you can see, here's, my, here's a little image showing uh, essentially a colored map of the number of rays we trace per thread on the screen. If every pixel is a thread. 
so the black areas we're tracing one or no or no pixels, uh, one or no rays, and the white areas we're tracing uh, sort of two, five, six rays. So you can see that well, there's only a relatively small number of pixels, um, but we're paying the cost of doing a lot more. So the solution to doing this uh, using direct compute uh, is we can take our rays and balance them across all the cores in one batch. So uh, we're, has anyone done a compute shader before, or CUDA, or uh, OpenCL, or anything like that? Put your hands up. Anybody? Yes, people at the back. Cool. Not that many, though. Um, so essentially, a compute shader is just like a pixel shader, but you control the scheduling. You don't have to write to a frame buffer or anything. You can write to your own buffers, read your own buffers in random order. It's quite a powerful thing, but it's still a simple shader-like thing. So how do we handle, uh, given a 16 by 16 block, and some of our pixels need to trace a lot of rays, what do we do? What we do is we go through in the shader first for the whole block and work out how many pixels are going to need lots of rays. And then we sync the shader, and then we spread those rays across all the threads in that block. And then we end up executing a small number of rays on every thread in the block, rather than no rays in most of them and a lot in some of them. We load balance across it. Uh, it's quite easy. It's quite a simple thing to implement in compute, but it's a very powerful concept. Uh, we do similar things with deferred lighting in blocks. Uh, this enables us to get really good performance, essentially tracing the quality of getting sort of 100 to 200 rays per pixel, but with the uh, performance of only tracing sort of three rays per pixel. Uh, so you can see, here's my tile buffer now that I'm processing uh, spread out evenly across the cores. There's still hot spots where uh, we hit edges or lots of edges, but the way it's balanced means that we don't have any extreme peak points. And the loads are balanced much better. And uh, here's to prove it works. This is temporary projection with hole filling in action. It's basically pretty good. And this gives us a, a technique that looks really good, really solid, and runs in probably three milliseconds or something on a good GPU. I lie, four milliseconds. Uh, so one ray per pixel, we could do it in about two milliseconds. 16 rays per pixel with holes, without any load balancing, we were getting about 12 milliseconds. And when we load balanced it, did it really smart, we could get that down to four milliseconds, which is a great result, I think. Uh, the final thing that I'm going to talk about, apologies for hammering through this, but we don't have infinite amounts of time, unfortunately. The final thing we're going to talk about is order-independent transparency. Uh, when you do transparency, when you render stuff transparently, basically, if you don't sort the things that you're rendering front, uh, back to front, if you just render them in the order they uh, come in, then they don't get composited properly and it looks weird. So uh, this gives us a ends up with a class of techniques where we're trying to solve this problem. A lot of people try doing things like um, sorting all the polygons before they render them, or but then you end up with what happens when polys intersect and you have to cut and it doesn't really breaks down. Uh, so people have tried the techniques like depth peeling, where you render the thing over and over again, but cutting slices in depth from back to front. Uh, that's very slow as well. We can now implement this on DX11 using a really nice way. Uh, we can store per pixel a linked list of all the samples that hit that pixel when you render them. So every poly that was rendered on that pixel, in no matter what order, gets shoved in a list. Then we sort the list in a post-process, and then we just composite it from back to front. Uh, so the DX11 enables us to do this because it enables us to do things like linked list structures on uh, GPU and shaders. This is great. Uh, there's two ways of implementing this. Uh, there's an ATI demo and paper out where they use a linked list. Um, they have a structured buffer bound to their shader. And uh, for every pixel that comes in, they uh, push it into a linked list using just an append into a linked list. This is really quick to implement, but 
um, it means that the end result pixels are scattered all over memory for every pixel. So for each pixel on the screen, the samples that go to make it up are completely randomly scattered in memory, which means that you thrash uh, all your caches when you're reading. Uh, so it makes it very quick to write, very slow to read. Uh, we don't do this. We use a stream compaction technique again. Um, so what we do is, for every pixel on the screen, we count the number of things that overdraw on it uh, using, basically, we just alpha blend additively one for every time we hit something. And then uh, what we do is we render another pass. We do a complete stream compaction on that buffer. So we reserve memory for every pixel for the samples that are going to lie on it. And then we do another pass where we shove the, uh, the actual samples into that buffer. Uh, it means that the generating the buffer is slightly slower because obviously you've got to do the whole compaction thing, although that is quite efficient. Um, you can do it in around a millisecond on a decent GPU or less. It's quite efficient. I think uh, I've heard that on a high-end ATI, it's something like a third of a millisecond to uh, do the compaction. Um, what it gives you is at the end, all the samples for a pixel are contiguous in memory. So if you're reading the thing over and over again, um, then it means it's much more efficient. You're not going to thrash the caches. It's pretty much like very efficient access. Order independent transparency is nice, but in the concept of making de in the context of making demos, there are cooler things that we can use because this structure is actually very useful. What this structure kind of is, if you think about it is uh, like every hit along the eye ray per pixel. It's, like a, it's a very good acceleration structure for ray tracing. What it also gives us is uh, the ability to use it for shadow maps, to do um, transparent shadow maps that actually work properly. So uh, you can get, by getting every pixel, uh, by the depth of every sample that hits a pixel, we can just loop through those um, when we're looking up the shadow map and uh, composite those uh, in a shadow pass. This gives us the result that we can do things like alpha blended uh, poly shadows uh, with translucency. We can do volume, uh, volume rendering shadows. We can do uh, particle shadows really nicely. It means that we can actually do proper shadow maps for particle systems that really work. They're not faked, they don't alias, they don't look dodgy, they actually just give you a proper result. Uh, the other thing that you can use them for, the, when you start thinking about what you can use this technique for, it's really useful and you get little ideas trigger in your head. And we also use them for something quite esoteric, which is uh, Boolean operations, CSG. We wanted to be able to take a mesh and cut holes in it. S something that is really conceptually simple that is a bitch to implement on a GPU uh, because you don't actually want to cut up the polys because it's a pain in the ass. And then you have to fill the holes up afterwards, so it's really annoying. So we didn't want to do that. We wanted to do a really nice pixel-based technique that enabled us to cut holes in polys and fill in the gaps. We decided to do this so we could use arbitrary meshes but cut them with like uh, primitives and other meshes and so on. So we're going to use uh, sign distance fields for this technique because we have them, and we have all the things to generate them offline, so we thought we'll just use them and use them and use them for every effect we can think of. Uh, cutting a hole in a polygon with a sign distance field is very easy. You just have the, poly the pixels positioned in world space from the, uh, on the mesh. You uh, sample the sign distance field, and if the distance is negative, it means you're inside the cut shape, so you just clip, clip that pixel, you kill it. That's very easy, it's very trivial to implement. The hard part is how you fill the holes afterwards. Uh, so we started thinking about this a lot. And the conclusion that we came to was that if you have a closed manifold mesh that's nice and clean and done properly, then when you cut a hole in it, the cut must lie between the front faces and the back faces. Somewhere between them, it must lie. With order independent transparencies technique, we have a history of pixels along the eye ray, a lot of samples along the eye ray for every pixel. We know all the back and front faces that were rendered on that pixel. 
which means that we have all the information to say, uh, on my pixel, I can look at the front face, cast a re like step along to the next sample, which is a back face, and uh, I can in uh, test the distance field at each point, find the point at which it cuts, and if it cuts uh, on that, in that sample, I render the color, the cut color. So it enables me to do these kind of Boolean operations uh, effectively on a pixel level in real time. Uh, results, so here's, the, um, here's a logo that we wanted to cut holes in. And as you can see, we cut holes in, it's cool, it worked. Uh, these are all shots from our upcoming demo. Please don't leak them or tell anyone or anything. It's strictly between us right now. Right? Uh, here we have a close-up of the logo. Uh, and yeah, we can cut holes in it. So all those holes are generated in fragment space. They're all done just using this technique of uh, casting through the, um, the, uh, the pixels, uh, the samples on a pixel, checking the distance field, finding the hit point, outputting the new normal and depth from that hit point and the new color, and uh, then doing all the other lighting and everything in post. So it's a neat technique. And I think the interesting thing about the technique is we're using something that has come out of uh, people trying to do research for games to find these kind of um, solutions to common problems. And uh, we're just abusing it completely to do a nice demo effect, which is completely impractical. No one really cares about in the real world, but looks cooler demo which is kind of the point of demo coding, isn't it? Uh, so that brings me to the end of my slides. Um, please, please vote for us. We need every vote. Come on, man. We haven't actually finished the demo, so uh, this could be quite a prayer that you actually have something to vote for. But uh, yes, that's my blog. If anyone wants to see that video that didn't play, then uh, come up at the end. Otherwise, I'm done. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Matt, for the incredibly informative t um, talk. Uh, is there any questions from the audience for Matt? Does anyone know what I was talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, are these order independent transparency effects in use in the Unigine engine? Because I actually watched the d demo just the other day, and mm. they had practically all uh, effects you can do transparent sh shadow maps, volumetric shadow maps, and mm. all that stuff except booleans. Is it that technique? There's not someone from Unity actually here, is there? Uh, no, no, Unity, Unigin. Oh, Unigy? Yes. Oh, no idea, sorry. I don't, uh, probably, okay. yeah. I imagine there probably yeah. is, yeah. There's um, ATI released a sample with code. So it's like quite, it's out, out in the open. People can implement it quite easily. I'm not saying they just nick the code or anything. I'm not saying they nick the code. But it's possible that, uh, yeah, it's quite a common technique now. It's getting more common. Yeah, so there's a paper, and they have read it, the paper and implemented it. Maybe not they come up with the technique. Yeah. Who knows? So we could have okay. done a huge disservice to them. Anyway, uh, yeah, I guess it's probably the same technique, yeah. It's kind of the only efficient way of doing that. So, yeah, it probably is. Any other questions? Yeah, any other questions? Okay. I'm free to go. Yeah, then thank you, Matt, again. Thanks. Yes. Thank <laughs> you.